everyone. We are live. We are live. Sabbath peace. He's alive. It's another opportunity for us to come together and hear and learn of the word of truth that's given to us by the Most High God. All honor goes to the Father through the Son, whose name is Yahushua. In him lies the only hope for salvation. We know that it is obtained by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast, and given freely as a gift to all who obey him. We understand that if you do not obey him, it is made manifest or made obvious that you do not believe. In this state, you should expect no good thing from the Most High. However, anything that you do get, whether it be a gift of tongues, a gift of prophecy, or any supernatural experience that you may have, it can and it will be used against you in the day of judgment. With that said, peace to the saints that are in the room, to the saints that couldn't make it, to the saints watching in on the camera, to the saints in the chat, to the saints scattered around the world that we don't even know about. But no peace to the wicked. The only thing we say to them is repent that they might live. All righty. Last week. What we talking about? O-S. Dang it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, I mean, what we talk about last week. Let me see. What did we talk about last week? Last week, we talked about. I can't even remember what we talked about last week. We were talking about what? What did we read? We read. Uh, what was we in Mark? Oh, we did Mark 7. Yes. Exactly. And That's right. We did Mark 7. So we read we read a little bit of Mark 7. We was talking about the traditions of the Pharisees and how the tradition of the Pharisees had us, you know what I'm saying, had us doing many things that came from the fathers, right? So our fathers handed down things to us. And one of the things that we didn't really go into a lot of detail of, but, but some of those fathers or some of those traditions came from, you know, the spirit that Nehemiah put on the people, right? So Nehemiah put on the people a number, a uh, 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 urgency to keep the law, like an urgency to obey what the law said and an urgency to even put, in some cases, laws before the law so that we don't even get close to breaking it. For example, he, he was the one that was, that was like, nah, these Gentiles can't even come in the gates. It's like, y'all can't, y'all can't, not only can y'all not sell to them, which is against our Sabbath to sell, but he said, you can't even buy from them on the Sabbath. Right, he is like, you know, what I'm saying no, and don't even let them come into the gates on the Sabbath. Right, so all that stuff that wasn't necessarily against our law for Gentiles to come in our gates, and it wasn't against our law. For, it's nothing in our law to say that we can't buy on the Sabbath. But he did that to prevent things. He did a couple other things that wasn't necessarily against the law, but he made a vow to the Most High God that that's how we that that's how him and a few of the other priests would uphold the nation. And so I think that spirit then. And when I say spirit there, I just mean that attitude, right? That attitude got passed down and different traditions were put on the people to keep us godly. But I think what's happened now is that the Pharisees that we're reading about, they're looking at these things and they're seeing them as equal to the word of the most high God. So when they look at the disciples, they're looking like, man, why, why don't the, your disciples wash their hands? Right. And we look we looked at how, how Yahushua took that one situation. And after he took that one situation, he then turned the whole thing around and then he started kind of explaining and teaching them other things, just showing my how how they put the traditions over the word of the most high God, how um, how, uh, you know, nothing that comes uh, in that comes from outside of us and into us can defile us. Right. And so we talked a little bit about that, talked a little bit about the uh, eating laws and went back to Noah, kind of looked at a few things over there. But all in all, we tried to we tried to break it down to make sure we could understand it. So. Now we're gonna continue on, and uh, it, it, it's a it's a similar theme. But now Yahushua is uh, he's walking around, and I want to say he's still up north in Capernaum at this point. Um, so let's grab uh, Matthew. We can start off Matthew chapter six. Uh, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter sixteen. Give me verse. Uh, uh, give me verse thirteen. This is Matthew chapter sixteen, verse thirteen. <clears throat> it works every time. <laughs> when Yahshua came into the coast of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Mm -hmm. So he asked his disciples, right? 
He came to Caesarea Philippi, so that's a little bit south of Galleria. Galleria <laughs> of uh, Galilee. You know what I'm saying? So he came, he came to uh, Caesarea Philippi, and he said, he asked his disciple, he said, who do these people be saying I am? Right? He is like, who do people say I am? He wanted to know. He was curious, right? Watch this. They said, some say that you are John the Baptist. Some right? So some of them say that you are John the Baptist. We know John the Baptist is a real figure, right? John the Baptist is the one who baptized Yahushua. So these people know John the Baptist, but remember, this ain't social. It ain't like John the Baptist we got a darn TikTok page. You know what I'm saying? They don't know what John the Baptist looked like. Some of them ain't never met the man. Some of them, even if they was around him, they don't remember what he looked like. A lot of these brothers look the same. It's different for us because we look at people all day, literally. You know what I'm saying? Like, look at various people all day, especially the famous ones. For them, they look like, well, that might have been John the Baptist. I don't know. Right? They said some people think he might be John the Baptist. Right? They confuse him with the actual John the Baptist who's dead at this point. Right? But they think, well, they think you John the Baptist. What else? Some say Elijah and others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Right. So then some of them say Elijah. Right. So Elijah is another prophet. He said some of them think you Jeremiah. And then they said and others think it's just very prophet. So other different people around the cities and around the towns of Israel looking at him like, I think he him. No, I think he him. I think he this guy. I think he this prophet. I think he this and notice that they name him prophets, right? Elijah, Jeremiah, or various prophets. They're naming prophets because the prophets uh uh grab uh second grab second Kings chapter two. Um give me second Kings chapter two. We can start at verse one. We have an event in our history that shows the spirit of a prophet landing on another prophet. So it'll give It'll give context to how they think he's another prophet. Like Jeremiah came came hundreds of years before him. Jeremiah dead and gone. So I just want I want y'all to see why people would think that he is a prophet that has, has already existed and died. And why do they think that this man living today would be his prophet or be the uh, the same prophet that lived before and died? It came to pass when Yahuwah would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind. But Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Right? So this is Elijah. This is one of the prophets that they thought Yahushua was, right? So this is this is Elijah. And then you also have the prophet Elisha. Both of these guys are prophets, right? So Elijah is like the master. Elisha is like his student, right? But they both prophets. Watch this. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Terry here, I pray thee, for Yahuwah hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, as Yahuwah liveth, as your soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So right? Leave so Elisha's like, man, look, I kind of have a feeling something crazy about to happen. Man, I'm not leaving your side. Right? Elijah's trying to tell him, like, man, go ahead on. You know what I'm saying? Everything going to be all right. You know what I'm saying? Why don't you go on in the town? He's like, no, nah, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you right now. I'm not leaving your side. As long as your soul is alive, I'm not leaving your side. Right? Keep going. Watch this. So they went down to Bethel, and the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that Yahuwah will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for Yahuwah hath sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as your soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophet that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that thy head today, knowest thou, oh, sorry, he said, Knowest thou that Yahuwah will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it, hold, hold your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Terry, I pray thee here, for Yahuwah has sent me to Jordan. And he said, As Yahuwah liveth, and as your soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on and 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off. And they too stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters. And they were divided hither and thither. So that right. So Elijah, look, Elijah hit the water, bow with a mantle. 
and then the water split, kind of like how Moses did it. It's just smaller water, right? He did it, the water split, and they walked around on dry foot. Keep going, watch this. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha right? So said, Elijah then, remember, Elijah is the prophet, the, the master prophet. He's asking Elisha, who's the student prophet, he's saying, Before I get taken away, because Yahuwah definitely about to take me away from you. So before I get taken away, just tell me what I should do for you, because you just won't leave my darn side. And so watch what Elisha say. Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. Right. He said, give me a double portion of your spirit. So in other words, the energy you got, the power that you got, give it to me times two. Right. Keep going. Watch this. And he said, thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass as they they still went on and talked that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it and he cried, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he right. So now clothes. Elisha, I mean, Eli Elisha is looking at Elijah and Elijah get taken up. It's chariots of darn fire and a darn whirlwind. Elijah get taken all the way up in that thing and Elisha get pushed back to make space for him to get taken up. And he watching this thing happen. But Elijah just told him, he said, listen, if you see this thing go down, it's going to happen for you. Exactly what you asked for. You're going to get a double portion of my spirit, a double portion of the power that the most High God has given me. Right. And he saw it, the whole thing go down and then Elijah go up in the whirlwind. So just imagine it's this powerful man that you look up to. This man got it all. He's the man around here. He's doing miracles. He's doing all types of stuff. And then all of a sudden he get taken up in a whirlwind. Woom, woom, woom. And chariots of fire carry his butt up all the way into the heavens where you can't see him no more. Uh oh, you know what I'm saying? The heaven where you can't see him no more. And after you can't see him, how do you think Elisha feel? Watch this. And Elisha saw it and cried, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and ripped them, rent them in two pieces. He took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell on him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell on him and smote the waters and said, where is Yahuwah God of Elijah? When he also had some in the waters, they parted hither and thither, and, Eli and Elisha went over. Right? So just like Elijah just smote the water, and he hit the water with his, hit his mantle, you know what I'm saying? Like, think of it like a like a darn scarf. He hit the water with that thing, and then the water split when Elijah did it. So now Elijah gone, he get taken up into heaven, and Elisha see it, he rented clothes, but he pick up Elijah's mantle, and then he walking back, and then he looking at and he hit the water. Think of him just like like doing it just like out of anger. You know what I'm saying? He hit the water. Ah, mad at God. You know what I'm saying? Where is the God of Elijah? You know what I'm saying? He hit the water like that, and all of a sudden, water darn split for his butt. You know what I'm saying? Then you can, you can imagine he probably did that. Where is the God of Elijah? Ah, crying because he, he lost his, he's like a dad to him, right? He lost his daddy. He looking like, ah, that water split. He looking like, oh, that thing really worked. I really got the power. Right? So then he walked across. Watch this. When the sons of the prophets, which were to view at Jericho, saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah does rest on Elisha. They came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. And they right? Him, he said, the spirit of Elijah, what? Rests on Elisha. So this is where, this is where the, the thought comes from of looking at a man right now and thinking that he could be a prophet that used to be. Right? This first happened with Elijah. I mean, with, yeah, with Elijah to Elisha, right? Elisha got the spirit of Elijah on him, and the people saw him and was like, hey, the spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. So that's how they looking at Yahushua. They looking at Yahushua like, Yahushua was asking them, who do they say I am, right? And when they're responding, they like, man, some people think you Elijah. So what they thinking is, 
you know what? The spirit of Elijah is resting on Yahushua. Some people think you Jeremiah. Some people thinking the spirit of Jeremiah is resting on Yahushua. And some of them think you one of these other prophets. Some of them think you John the Baptist. The spirit of John the Baptist is resting on Yahushua. Because remember, John the Baptist came up. And remember what John the Baptist was saying? He was saying, I must decrease so that he must increase. So when people looking at it, they looking at it like, okay, so John the Baptist is dead, but his spirit is resting on Yahushua, right? So that's what, that's what it means. That's what they saying when they saying, who do people say I am? And they naming all these prophets that are dead. They're, what they're really saying is they believe that the spirits of these prophets are resting on Yahushua, right? It's very important that we understand that because this is going to play out even in Maybe not in our day, but this is going to play out in the future where you're going to have prophets that's walking around here and we're going to look at them like the spirit of these old prophets are resting on these, these prophets. Right. So it's important for us to see this in the scripture and to be able to make sense of it. Oh, we got grab uh, Luke. This is Luke chapter one. Give me verse five. This is Luke chapter one, verse five. I want y'all to see what, what happened with John the Baptist. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judah, a certain priest named Zechariah of the course of Abia, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of Yahuwah blameless. And they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of Yahuwah. And the whole right. So Zechariah was a priest. This is we reading about. Uh... John the Baptist's daddy, right? He was a priest. Turn that phone off, boy. Turn it off. Zachariah is a priest, right? Keep going. Watch this. According to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of Yahuwah. And the whole multitude of the people were praying uh, without at the time of incense. Mm -hmm. And there appeared unto him an angel of Yahuwah standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah mm -hmm. saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the right. Angel, so Zechariah, he Zechariah just doing his darn job. He up in the he up in the uh, temple, and he got to do it by course. So it's just his time of the year. Like it's just different times of the year. Think of it like uh, the National Guard. You know what I'm saying? Or the reserves, the Army reserves. You know what I'm saying? It's like at certain times in the year they got to go out. You ever been with? You ever knew somebody that was in the Army reserves or in the National Guard? And it's just like. Oh, yeah, no, I got to go out to duty. And it's like they not flying to Iraq or anything. They just got to go out for physical training. Right. And they be gone for like a couple of weeks or going for like a month or whatever. Then they come back and they go back to their regular job. Right. That's kind of how he was. Right. So Zachariah, all the priests had a course. So it'd be like two months out of the year. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it's like two months out of the year. They would have to serve at the temple. And his job at this point was to light the incense. Right. So he's sitting there lighting the incense, doing the job like he'd done a million times before. He lighting the incense, lighting the incense. Then all of a sudden, an angel appeared to him. So he looking like, whoa. You know what I'm saying? And so he got scared. You know what I'm saying? When he saw the angel appear to him, he got scared. Watch what happened next. The angel said unto him, Fear not, Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son. Thou shalt mm -hmm. call his name John. Right. So he said, fear not. Remember, he didn't think he can have no babies. Him and his wife, they didn't think they could have babies. So he said, fear not. Your wife is going to bear a son. Your, your prayer being, because this is apparently what he's been praying for. He like, your prayer has been heard. Watch this. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be, a, shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. 
and many of the children of Israel shall be shall he turn to the Lord their God, mm -hmm. and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the, the what? children in the spirit and the power of Elijah. So, like John the Baptist himself came in the spirit of Elijah. So this is what the angel told Zechariah. He said, "Look, you're gonna have a son. Go ahead and name him John the Baptist. But listen, name him John." <laughs> but listen, he gonna come in the spirit and in the power of Elijah, right? So it's just like what happened with Elisha. After after Elijah got taken up into heaven, Elisha had the spirit of Elijah on him, and so now the angel is telling them, now this other prophet, John the Baptist, he's gonna grow up and he's gonna have the spirit of Elijah on him, right? Because that's how it works. But all of this is according to prophecy, right? Grab, um, grab Malachi. Let's do, give me Malachi, give me Malachi, give me Malachi 4. Uh, Malachi 4, maybe verse 4. This is Malachi chapter four. Give me verse four. The Malachi four. Yeah, Malachi chapter four, verse four. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel. With the statue. He said, remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, right? Which I commanded in the land of Horeb. Watch this. For all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Right? So be before the day of Yahuwah, he said, I will send you the prophet Elijah. Now, at this point, the, the writer of this, Malachi, he's coming at the very end, right? He's coming at the very end before our people, uh, I mean, after our people came back into our land, right? So this is, this is only maybe 400 years ago, you know, or, or from the time that we're reading about right now. So before Yahushua, it may be, it may be 300, 400 years before Yahushua, right? At that point, we had already seen Elijah. Elijah was way back in Kings. Elijah was probably 400 some years before Malachi was written. So Malachi is talking about before the day of Yahuwah, Elijah going to come back. So that's why the, that's why the angel had to tell Zechariah, yo, John, when he grow up, the spirit of Elijah is going to rest on him because the prophecy has to be fulfilled. Like he got to come back. Before the Messiah. Right? Keep going. Watch this. Let's see what John the Baptist's goal is. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of Yahuwah. He shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. Lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So his job is to turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers. We're going to talk more about that when we get to Revelations. Right? But that is John. That's 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 the, the Elijah's job when he returns. Right. And that's what the angel is telling us that John the Baptist is. He's telling us, hey, John the Baptist, man, that's you know what I'm saying. The spirit of Elijah is going to rest on him. Baby girl. Sit down. Baby girl. Sit down. Right. He said the spirit of Elijah. Take that chain off. Take that stuff off her. Right. Uh, he said the spirit of Elijah going to rest on him. Keep going. Or actually. uh uh. Go back. Where was we at? Matthew 16, what? Uh, it's Matthew yeah, chapter 16. Matthew 16, verse 14. Verse 14.
in Matthew chapter 16, verse 14. Watch the book say. And they say, some say you are John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So now it make a little bit more sense. Why they like, why are y'all naming old? You looking at this man. Why would y'all think he's an old prophet that's been dead for hundreds and hundreds of years? You know what I'm saying? Well, this is why, because we got a history of y'all, y'all coming to us telling us the spirit of this old prophet is resting on this other band. And this prophet is going to return, right? We got prophecy telling us that a prophet who died previously or that's gone previously is going to return. So when they look at when they look at that, that's a possibility for anybody who believe our book, right? They looking at it like it's a bad man. He's doing miracles and stuff. And who else did miracles like that? Hey, Elijah. We can read about that in Kings. Remember Elijah was doing all that stuff? And look, he might be like Elijah. Maybe the spirit of Elijah is resting on him. Maybe the spirit of Jeremiah is resting on him. Maybe the spirit of one of the other prophets is resting on him, right? It's kind of how they're looking at it. Keep going. Watch this. Did I lose you? Where you up? Uh oh, we lost Brother T. Are you gonna you gonna pick up? You gonna take over? Uh, I thought you see you know what I'm I thought you was stepping in the time of need. Sit down, man. What y'all doing? Oh, you need to cut that out, boy. All right, we got, you know what I'm saying, got some technical dip difficulty. We got to get Brother T back in here. All right, you back? Yeah. All right. All right, y'all be quiet. Sit down. All right. Did we lose him again? Goodness gracious, what's going on? <laughs> Hello? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, what happened? I don't know. All right. Let's, let's see if this thing works now. You ain't clicking on nothing or nothing? No. It just went like you just disappeared. You know, I was like, you was talking, he just disappeared. Trying to shut us down. It's the Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is uh this is Matthew chapter 16. What verse? We on verse 15. Matthew chapter 16, verse 15. Watch what the book say. So he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Right, so y'all, she was looking like, okay, I hear what everybody else say, but what y'all, who y'all think I am, right? And watch what happened. Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Right? So Simon Peter, he jumped right out. He said, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now, we talked about this last week, or maybe it was the week before, but the prophecy that was given to David is that your son, right? Uh, a, a child that comes from your bowels would be king and he will be this is what y'all said to david and he will be a son to me right 
And then he also said you will be king. Right. And one of the things that we what, that we did for our kings is our kings were anointed. And the way that you say anointed in Hebrew is Messiah. Right. So in other words, he's saying you are the king and you are the son of God, which is according to the prophecy of David. So that's special. He's recognizing them accurately because Yahushua is not coming in the spirit of Elijah. Yahushua is not coming in the spirit of of uh, Jeremiah, not coming in the spirit of one of the other prophets. Right. Yahushua is coming as the Messiah, the son of the living God, according to the prophecy. So Simon understood that because he'd been walking around with Yahushua and he believed the stuff that Yahushua was saying. Right. So when he said it, this is what Yahushua responded with. Watch this. Yahshua answered and said unto him, Blessed are thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh, right? and blood, flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. So now Yahushua came back to him, and he told him, when it say Bar-Jonah, it's saying son of Jonah. That's what Bar-Jonah means. It's, it's Hebrew for saying son of Jonah. So he told him, he's like, yeah, you're the Messiah, you're the son of God. So then the Messiah repeated to him, he looking like, or replied to him, he looking like, okay, I'm going to tell you who you are. You probably don't realize you're the son of Jonah, right? You come from Jonah's lineage. So he said, you're the son of Jonah, you know what I'm saying? And blessed are you because flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. Now, do you think Simon feel like he was a prophet at that moment where he was just like, when Peter, when Peter was sitting there, do you feel like, uh, something's coming over me? I, something just told me that you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. No, in his mind, he was just saying something that he thought he knew. He was just saying what he believes. But what, what the Messiah was saying to him is you wouldn't know that unless the Most High God told you that. And it's important for us to see that because that is how it works. In our minds, in our reality, things just feel like we know it or things just feel like we learned that or we're able to do these certain things or things are able to happen to us in a certain way. For us, it just feels like normal. It feels like regular stuff. But behind the scenes, there is a lot of spiritual things happening that we don't see and that we don't understand. Right. So where where Peter just thinking, oh, yeah, you the you the Messiah. I believe you the Messiah. You the son of the living God. Most high God had to use Yahushua to reveal to him and say, the only way you know that is because my father revealed it to you. So that takes us back to what we read the week before last. Right. Hold what we got here. Go back to John. John chapter 6, give me verse 43. This is John chapter 6, verse 43. John chapter 6, verse 43. You thought you were going to be able to read for your Uncle T. You can't even turn in the book. You know what I mean? You got to be able to get there. You know what I'm saying? You got to be able to flip through them things and get there. You know what I'm saying? You got to put you in training. Yahshua sure, therefore answered and said unto them, Remember not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. He I says, No him man up. can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. Right? Keep going. I will raise him up at the last day. Uh-huh. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. They shall all be taught of y'all. Watch this. Every man, therefore, that has heard and has learned of the Father cometh unto me. So every man who has heard and learned of the Father comes to me. So that process is being played out with Peter, Simon, right? And so when he's looking, he's like, man, I feel like, I feel like you're the son of the Most High God. I feel like you're the Messiah. In his mind, he just saying stuff, right? So y'all sure had to reveal to him, man, that's, that's the Father that drew you. Right. So behind the scenes, there's different things going on than what our reality tells us. That's why you can't get caught up in just reality. You got to look at what does the book say about my life? Right. If my life produces this type of fruit, what does the book say about it? Because reality, these people will tell you everything. These people will tell you that a girl ain't a girl. They'll tell you that they don't know the definition of a woman. That's what they'll tell you. Right. They let a darn her mavericks fight in the darn Olympics against a woman. 
get knocked out. He put, put the tip. <laughs> bow, bow, bow. That girl was like, Snap, nope, tapping out. How you train all your life just to get work? Bow, bow. That thing's not fair. That thing's not. But that's what happened when you let, let her darn. Our book, you know what our book would have said about this dude? Disqualified. Because you can't have both parts and just think, you know what I mean? Like you're not normal. And it's okay. Sometimes you got to understand when you're not normal. Even when people feel like they're gay and stuff, right? These wicked people, what they try to do, if you feel like you're gay, it ain't run, nothing wrong with feeling like you're gay. Ain't nothing wrong with me like, you know what? I kind of want to, you know what I'm saying? I kind of want to do some freaky deaky with the wrong type of person. Ain't nothing wrong with feeling that way. Now the next step is you got to say, that's wrong. It's wrong for me to take action on that. So now you got to say, okay, I'm either going to change the way I feel because your feelings don't, these people lie to you and make you think your, your feelings rule you. Your feelings are not in control of you. If you feel a certain way, guess what? Make yourself feel a different way. And if you don't want to make yourself feel a different way, guess what? Well, stay by your darn self. Stay by your darn, darn self. But you don't want to, you don't want to let your feelings commit you into a sin, but that's what these people will tell you to do. These people will tell you, look, these people will look you square in your darn face and be like, gender is a social construct. We made that up. Your shoes is a darn social construct too. I bet you ain't going to walk outside barefoot with your nasty butt. I know you do. You you ought to be you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Yeah. Right? But that's what they do. Everything is a what ain't a social darn construct. Most of the stuff we socially construct make a little bit of sense. As stupid as these people are. But they are they are trying to make us believe everything makes sense and everything is okay because that's rebellion to our God. Right? Our the our most the most our God didn't he didn't shy away from letting people know that you're different. That there's something wrong with you? If you couldn't speak, the man called you dumb. Not dumb in the sense that we use it. In the, when we read the old English and the way it's translated, the book will call it dumb in the book. He's not, he's not saying dumb as in you can't think. But we, we, we definitely look at it and say this person's different. This person got leprosy. His butt got a... You think it's my fault I catch a disease? Guess what? Get your butt outside the darn camp. It don't matter who fault it is. The facts are the facts. You are who you are. Get your butt outside the camp and you need to be locked away from the rest of the people. We don't play that stuff because you can spread that thing. If you deformed, you think you're going to be a pre your, your leg didn't grow in right. You got, you know what I'm saying? You got a little nub for a leg because you were born deformed like that. Is that your fault that you were born that way? That thing ain't got nothing to do with you. You was born like this. You ain't got nothing to... But guess what? The most high God ain't looking like, oh, that ain't her fault. You know what I'm saying? It ain't her fault she was born a woman. She should still be able to be a priest. No, if you're a woman, you can't be a priest. If you deformed, you can't be a priest. That's law for us. So it was normal for us to see ourselves for who we are and accept our lot in life. Now, people begin to see themselves a certain way. And they don't accept their lot in life. Right? I see myself and I identify as whatever these people told me I should identify with. And now they put you in a persuasion to say, no, you don't have to accept who you think you are or how you was born. You can be whatever you want to be. And that's a lie. That's delusion. That's psychosis. Right? But we would have told her in our law, we would have told her hermaphrodite. Now you can't. You can't represent Israel, you know what I'm saying, in the Olympics. Listen, in our version of Israel, not these white people version of Israel, if we had a hermaphrodite that had both parts, you know what I'm saying, and then they came up, tried to put on their darn pants, be like, your butt down now, you know what I'm saying? Sit your little butt down. You can't play in the Olympics, not as a boxer fight, no girl. That just doesn't make sense. You got to fight another hermaphrodite, you know what I'm saying? Two little freaks, y'all darn, do what y'all do, fight, 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 so who wins? That's a fair fight. It's not a fair fight, me going up against a girl, and I'm a darn man, technically, with girl parts. That's a weird old thing. Ain't your fault you were born that way. I ain't nobody, can't nobody blame you. The facts are the facts. Our book would say, what about that person? I bet you can't enter into the congregation of the Most High God. 
Right? You can't enter into it. That's not, that's not our law. Right? Nowadays, we look at that as mean you're excluding them and you're marginalizing this. Thing. That's how they try to trick your mind and thinking, oh, you know what? It's cool. But guess what? And why they say, hey, you excluding this person and you're leaving them out and and you're marginalizing them and you're being a bigot and they're they going to say all that stuff about me, right? Then at the same time, they're going to tell you, oh, no, I encourage you. Kill your baby because it's inconvenient for you. Go ahead and get an abortion. Hold on. So I'm marginalizing a little a, a, a living person by telling them, you know what? You are who you are. This is how you got to deal with it. That's marginalizing. That's me being a bigot. But it's cool for you to say this baby don't deserve to live because it's inconvenient for somebody. Because if things didn't go as according to plan when we were doing what we wasn't supposed to be doing in the first place. These people are sick people and they warp our minds in this thinking. And if you don't know the scripture, it'll make sense to you. It'll make sense that they walk around saying your body, your choice to a woman. Because it's like. Yeah. Women been oppressed for a long time. You know what I'm saying? You know what? It is my body. And you know what? It is my choice. And they make it look. They they present that thing to y'all like it's a win. And all these knucklehead dudes out here saying what? Her body, her choice. Because I don't want to take care of no kids. You know what I'm saying? Her body, her choice. Right? All these darn rapists is running around here. And y'all don't even realize how much this stuff happens. They rape these girls in their family and they family talk these women into getting the abortion when this wild stuff happened. And all this stuff goes quiet. No accountability for the man. No accountability on this situation. No accountability for the nasty family that let this stuff happen. And you know what helps make it go away? Kill the baby that came from this. Right? All these things is wild and it's sick and it's perverse and it puts our mind where we can't even judge stuff properly. And the only thing the Most High God is saying the whole time is, man, just be who you are and accept what come with it. If you don't like who you're supposed to like, you know what I'm saying? If you don't like the opposite sex, ain't, you ain't, look, you can't do nothing about that. Again. You can't do nothing about not being attracted to something, something that you're supposed to be attracted to. But now if you end up finding yourself attracted to something you're not supposed to be attracted to, now you got to stop yourself. Right? Same thing for a man, for a woman. Right? If a man or a woman grow up and they find themselves attracted to somebody that they're not married to, you got you to gotta, you gotta stop yourself. You got to restrict yourself. Are you doing the sin just like everybody else? Right? Everybody got the same rules. You can't change the game just because you don't like the rules. You got you to gotta learn how to win with what you got. You got to accept your lot in life, accept who you are, accept what your responsibility is to the most high God. And you got to count that as glorious. You got to count that and say, this is worth it for me to enter into the kingdom. And if it's not, then going out there and do what you want to do. You're going to burn in hell anyway. All right. Keep going. Not that any man has seen the Father, save he which is of God, he has seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes on me has everlasting life. Mm -hmm. I am that bread of life. The fathers did eat men in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. You I can jump back. Hear me? No, you can jump. Uh... Uh, jump back to uh, where we at? Matthew sixteen, what? Seventeen. Seven. We in seventeen now? Matthew sixteen, seventeen. Oh, sixteen, seventeen. It's Matthew chapter sixteen, verse seventeen. Watch the book say. Yahshua answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar Jonah, for flesh and blood did not reveal it to, to, unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And mm -hmm. also, and I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my congregation. And the gate yeah, so he called him Peter. So this is where Simon got his name Peter. So when we talk about Peter, 
it's really Simon. Simon is his real name, but the Most High God called him Peter. In Hebrew, it's it's a bunch of translation, but he's calling them a Hebrew name that means rock or stone. You know what I'm saying? And so he's basically telling them, like, you are the rock. You are, you know what I'm saying? You're the strong piece of this thing. And he's saying, I'm about to build my congregation on top of you. You know what I'm saying? Keep going. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was the Messiah. Right. Then he told all his, his disciples, he's like, yeah, yo, uh, everything we just talked about, don't tell nobody that I'm the Messiah now. Keep it on the low. Because remember, he's not coming to be the Messiah right now. He's the Messiah. He can't do nothing about it. But he's not coming to take that position of king right now. So you tell him, keep it on the low. Some of these people might go crazy if they hear that. You know what I'm saying? Keep going. From that time forth began Yahshua to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and to be killed and be raised on the third day. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, thou shalt not be unto that that this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto him, Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. For that right. So now look, not the look, that be of God. so now Peter in his mind, remember, it's important to understand this. Peter in his mind, he first said, hey, you're the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. Now, Peter didn't know that the most high God had revealed that to him and put that on his heart to say all this stuff is happening inside of Peter. But in his mind, I'm just saying the right thing, right? So then in the same way, you fast forward a couple of verses, Yahushua's like, listen, this is how I got to play out. I'm the Messiah. I'm going to go down. The elders and the Jews and the Pharisees, they're going to set your boy up. They're going to kill me. But don't trip. I'm going to come back. He's explaining this. But when they hear the Pharisees are going to kill you, then Peter, thinking that he's doing the right thing, thinking that he's just doing what's right, he jump in front and he say, no, not so, my master. There's no way I'm going to let nobody kill you. I wouldn't dare let that happen. Yep, the Messiah kind of said, Yahushua let them know, listen, this is how it's going to play out. I'm going to die. Just going to happen. Ain't no way around it. I'm going to die. Right? But then I'm going to come back. Peter jump. No. Ne I never let nobody get to you. Please. Don't, don't be talking like that. Don't speak that type of stuff into existence. You ain't going to die. I got you. Don't worry about it. We have never let nothing happen to you. So Yahushua look at him saying, and watch what he say. Read it again. Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but thou, those that be of men. So he called Peter Satan. This is the same Peter just a couple verses ago that he told the, the the father revealed that to you. The only way you can know that is because the father revealed that to you. Then a couple verses later, he called that same man Satan. He said, you are Satan. Get behind me. You are an offense to me. And that's how quickly it happens. How we be feeling like, oh, yeah, we right. And the most I got to acknowledge us being right. And in the, in the next sentence, your butt can be wrong. In the next sentence, your butt can make a, a darn mistake. That's because we, in our mind, think we're just saying stuff and we're just doing stuff. But that's not the case. We are constantly being influenced by dark forces and light forces. Constantly being influenced. Everything that we say, everything we're doing is being influenced and pushed and pulled from somewhere. So at one hand, the most high God is pushing them to say, you the Messiah. You the son of the living God. And then on the other hand, Satan is telling them, hey, you should protect your friend. Don't let him die. Both of those sound like good things. Why would I let my friend die? Right. That sounds like a good thing. But Yahushua is telling you that thing that seems good is going to be used for evil. You are Satan for doing that. You are an offense to me. The only way we can get this thing right is if we know the scripture. Right. Watch what y'all should say next. But what is it? Wait. 
For whosoever shall save his life, wait, sorry, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. Whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a, what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Mm hmm. Keep going. Let's this should be with chapter 17. Yeah. All right, 17, verse 1. Watch this. After the, and after six days, Yahshua will take Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bring them up into a high mountain apart. So Yahushua yeah. brought three people with him. He brought Peter. Right. That's the one that he just named Rock. He named him Peter and he brought James and he brought John. Right. This is not John the Baptist. This is John the disciple. Right. So he brought three people with him. Right. Watch this. It was transfigured before them and his face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as the light. And right. So then and then so then he started to change in front of him and his face started to glow like 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 white. I mean, uh, like the sun. sun, and then his his uh his clothes started to grow, glow white. You know what I'm saying? So he just super shiny. You know what I'm saying? He's like glowing, and they looking at him like, "What in the world? You this is like don't put yourself in Christian brain. Put yourself in real life brain. This your buddy. He be doing crazy stuff sometimes, but you never seen him do this. And now he's starting to glow in front of you, and it's just like, when does it end with this guy? Like, what else can he do? Like, this guy is he's just a different guy. So he's starting to glow. Watch this. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with them. Then answering Peter and said unto Yahshua, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou will, let us make let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Well, so then said, when they looking at him, he's shining. All of a sudden, they see Moses. And they see Elijah talking to him. So here we go talking about Elijah again, right? So not only do the people think that Yahushua was Elijah, not only did the angel tell John the Baptist that John the Baptist would come in the spirit of Elijah, but the prophecy also told us that Elijah would come and that he would uh, turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the children back to the fathers. All these things surrounding Elijah. And then what do you know? You see Elijah again. And Elijah is standing there right with Yahushua while he's glowing and Moses is there. So Peter, he don't know what he darn saying. He just jump up like, oh, uh, I think he got to be scared out of the darn mind. Seeing it. Uh, I just uh, I'll make a, a tent for all three of us. Uh, I, I, I think it's appropriate that we should be here and we see it. Let me make a tent right now. Then watch what happened. Well, he yes, big. Behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when so then a over, white cloud overshadowed him. Right? And anybody who's reading with us in the Bible in a year, this should sound familiar. Right? Because remember when Solomon finished building the temple, what happened? The cloud. That kept the priest from going in there and ministering. Huh? Right? Didn't a white didn't a cloud fill up the temple and the priest couldn't go into it? Right? They couldn't go into it and minister because the cloud filled it up. Then after that, the most high God spoke to Solomon. It's like, yeah, I heard your prayer. Right? And then the same thing, if we go all the way back to the beginning of our Bible in the year or the beginning of this Bible study series when we started to uh started to read from the beginning of Genesis, you remember that Moses. Right. Moses built the tabernacle yeah. and he, the book say he reared it up. And after he reared it up, a cloud filled that, too. And when the cloud filled it, nobody could go on the inside. So the same thing is happening here with Yahushua. No building, nothing being built. But Yahushua is right there. And then the cloud filled it up and the Most High God spoke and say, this is my son now. But listen to him. That's what he said. Destroy this temple in three days. He's saying he is the tabernacle of the Most High God. 
He is the temple of the Most High God. He is our place of worship. Right? That's going to be important for what we understand in a little bit. But based off of what we already read, if y'all remember, grab uh, John chapter 4. Help me. You're going to have to help me find it. It's John chapter 4, probably like verse, mm, maybe verse 16, maybe. Let's try John chapter 4, maybe verse 16. I'm a look, I'm a bad boy if I got this. Look, if it's verse 16 or a little bit after verse 16, maybe like within a verse or two, I'm a bad boy. Look at me. You know what I'm saying? I'm a bad boy. Sometimes, yeah, male. Sometimes you, male. Sometimes. Sometimes, male. And Yahushua said unto her, Go call thy husband and come here. Mm hmm. Watch this. And the woman answered, This is verse 16. Yeah, this is verse 16? Yeah. That's a bad boy. That's hate. That's hate. That's hate. That's hate coming from right over there. I'm just telling you that's hate. Get behind me, Satan. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Woman answered and said, I have no husband. And y'all should uh -huh. have her. You have well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that, in that sayest thou truly. Mm -hmm. Woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Yahshua said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye but what? Ye wor ye worship, ye know not what. He said, You don't know what you were. He said, Listen, your father told you that you the first of all, you were darn Gentile. You ain't got no darn connection to our darn book. If you want to learn the book, you come down to Jerusalem like the rest of the Gentiles and you learn it from us. Right? But then your father told you you're supposed to be worshiping this mountain. The other, the, the, my brothers tell you that you should be worshiping down over in, 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 at the temple in Jerusalem. But he's telling her, listen, the time is going to come where you're not going to worship it either one of those places. He said, I'm not even about to have this argument, you, with, with, argument with you right now. Because what you're talking about is temporary anyway. He said the time is coming soon where you're not going to worship there or here. Right? He's saying you don't know what you worship. You have no idea what you're worshiping. You don't know the book, the scripture, or the prophecy. He said instead, watch this. For so you... Yea, worship, yea, know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Mm -hmm. For the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God he said, you're going to have to worship in spirit and in truth. So when he said that, we didn't know what that meant. Right? When we read this several weeks ago, we didn't know what that meant when he was talking about, you're going to have to worship in spirit and in truth. But now, if we know the scripture, and we fast forward to uh, Matthew 17, where we are reading, and we see he start lighting up and start glowing. And after he start glowing, the cloud fill. And then we look at that and be like, wait a minute. That's familiar. That's the same thing that happened to Solomon when he finished, excuse me, the temple. And you know, that's also the same thing that happened to Moses when he finished the tabernacle. Oh, this is what he means about worshiping in spirit and truth, maybe. He's really telling us that he is the temple. Oh, you know what? At the beginning of the gospel, we ain't got to go back and get it. But in John, I think it was chapter two, maybe chapter, yeah, John chapter two, maybe. At the end, he said, destroy this temple, talking about himself. But they didn't know at the time he was talking about himself. So the disciples are slowly starting to put this stuff together because he's just dropping hints along the way. The whole time, all he's doing is dropping this little hint, that little hint, that little hint, just trying to figure out what's going on and trying to figure out which one, which hint is going to give us the answer. How do we make sense of what this man is telling us? Because so much of what he's tell, telling us is just partial. It's just a little piece. How do we piece all this stuff? So he's giving these people a puzzle. You can see... Each week that we read a little bit more about what he said the previous week or in previous weeks are starting to come together a little bit more based off of what we read. And that's you have to understand that 
This is happening in real time for the people that stand around. Sure, we got a book where we can flip pages and we can kind of reference stuff. They can't do that in real time. In real time, they see a man, he doing something crazy. It's making them, it's causing them to react emotionally. They brain probably, probably not even thinking about all this stuff because it's such a surprise. They're so shocked to see some of this stuff happening in real life. Some of them are shocked and they looking like, no, nah, that man must got a demon. I ain't never seen nothing like that. The way he talking, he must got a demon. Some of them shocked and looking like, no, take me now. You are, you are the Messiah, right? You're the one. Just make this man king right now, right? So it's all these extremes that these people are dealing with, but they're all trying to make sense of it, right? They all trying to look at it and be like, okay, well, who exactly are we dealing with, right? Go back. This is, uh, this is Matthew chapter 17. Keep going. Because the cloud filled, right? And nobody could, you know what I'm saying? Nobody could come in. That's just like the temple. That's just like uh, the tabernacle. Watch this. It's Matthew chapter 17. What verse? 28. Matthew chapter 7, 28. Yeah. Okay, it's Matthew chapter Wait, 17. No, no, no. We are, huh? on, we are on Matthew 17, verse 5. Okay, Matthew chapter 17, verse 5. That sounds a little bit more believable. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Yahshua came and touched them and said, Arise, and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Yahshua only. Right? So then Moses and Elijah disappeared. Because remember, he was sitting there talking to Moses and Elijah when they saw it. Then Peter jumped in and was like, uh, I make I make y'all some tents. I make three tents for y'all right now. Then all of a sudden, the the cloud came and Most High God spoke out of the cloud like, "This is my son." Then all of a sudden, they shot y'all. Sure, walk over there and touch him and kind of wake him up. And after that, they look and they don't see nothing but regular y'all. Sure, right? So they looking like, "What in the world was that?" But they all saw it. Keep going. Watch this. And as they came down from the mountain. Yahshua charged them, saying, tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. He said, you keep this to yourself until I come back from the dead. And but they looking at him. They hear him saying these things, but they haven't. Like right now, it seemed like it'll make sense to us, right? Somebody say, hey, look, when I come back from the dead, you know what I'm saying? Then you can share that story. Right now, we look at it be like, oh, he's talking about he's going to die and come back. But you got to let Yahushua saying all types of wild stuff to him. He, Yahushua every day is talking to them saying, you know, the light of your eye. Yeah, eat my flesh, drink my blood, the light of your eye. You know what I'm saying? He talking to them about, you know, sowing seed into the into until until into stony places and thorny places and all this. He's talking to them in all these parables. So they they don't know what to take literally or not. They just looking at it like, so when he say, Yeah, when I come back to the dead, they probably looking at that like, okay. So he's saying that he going he gonna he gonna take a rest disappear for a while and he gonna come back they not looking at it like the man literally gonna die right they 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 trying to make sense of everything that he's saying so he said okay yeah i'm gonna come back from the dead when i do you keep that story until the end right keep going and his disciples asked him saying why then say the scribes that elijah must come first Right. So the disciples asked the question. They were saying, listen, the scribes, in other words, the teachers, the experts of the book, they telling us that, no, nah, Elijah has to come first. When they say first, they talking about like the end of the world. Right. Before everything play out, before the Messiah come, before he takes not into the world, but into how things are in that age, before before the Messiah takes the throne and judges the rest of the nation. The Messiah, the uh, the uh, Elijah has to come before that. And they saying like, you know, what I'm saying like, why do they say that? Like, if you're the Messiah, right, you're already here. How can they say that? You know, what I'm saying that like Elijah has to come first. So now Yahushua has to defend that. But he's looking like, yes, I did tell y'all the Messiah. And I did tell y'all not to tell nobody else I'm the Messiah. So now y'all sure got to make it make sense because everything got to go according to prophecy. Right. So watch this.
Yahshua answered and said unto them, Elijah truly shall come first come and restore all things. But I right. Said, so he's saying it in the future tense. Elijah truly must come first and restore all things. Then watch. He also talks in the past tense. Watch this. But I say unto you that Elijah has come already and they knew him not. But have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise, right? Go ahead. Likewise, shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. So they now he's saying, listen, and Elijah. So not only does Elijah have to come in the future, and he has to restore all things. But let me tell you something: Elijah already came, also, and they treated him however they wanted to. So now you know because he said that he's not talking about the original Elijah, that the the Elijah the prophet. He talking about they understood he's talking about John the Baptist, right? Because that's what the angel told a lot. I mean, told uh, Zechariah is that you're going to have a son and he going to he going to come in the spirit of Elijah. Right. So all of this is like starting to come together and he's starting to try to figure. I mean, the people are starting to figure it out. Right. Greg, hold, hold that. Go to um, Isaiah chapter 40. We're going to come right back. Go to Isaiah chapter 40. Give me verse three. It's Isaiah chapter 40. Verse three. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of Yahuwah and make his path, uh, make straight in the desert a highway of, for our God. Mm -hmm. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low. The crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain. The glory of Yahuwah shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of Yahuwah has spoken it. The voice said, cry. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. Grass withereth, the flower fadeth because the spirit of Yahuwah blows upon it. Surely the people is grass. Grass wither and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Mm -hmm. O Zion, that bring good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, that brings good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold he said what? Lift up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, what? Behold your God. Keep going. O Zion, that bringest good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem, that bringest good tidings. Lift up thy voice with strength. Lift up and be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, Yahuwah God will come with strong with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. And he shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom. And shall mm -hmm. gently lead those that are with with young he's talking about the future right he's talking about what's still yet to come but watch this keep going who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and met it out heaven with a span and comprehended the and comprehended the dust of the earth in measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in in the balance who has directed the spirit of yahuwah or being his counselor has taught him with whom took he counsel or who instructed him and taught him in the path of judgment, taught him knowledge, <laughs> and showed to him the way of understanding. Lo, the nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as a small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles and a very little is as a very little thing. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor the beast thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted of him less than nothing in vanity. To whom to whom then will ye liken God, or what likeness will ye compare unto him? Mm -hmm. The work the work the workman melteth a graven image, and the goldsmith spreads it over the over with gold, and casts silver chains. He that is so impoverished that he has no oblation chosen a tree that will not rot, he seeketh unto him a cunning workman to prepare a graven image that shall not be moved. Have ye not known? Have ye not heard? Has it not been told to you from beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretches out the heavens as a curtain, 
and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in, that bringeth the princes to nothing. He makes he bringeth the, the what vanity. Bringeth the this, princes to nothing. This, this is the most high God letting y'all know what's gonna happen at the end. Right? Every ruler, when they say princes, it's talking about ruler, it ain't talking about a king's son. He's talking about rulers, right? So he's saying he brings all the rulers to nothing. All these people that was running the world, all the presidents, all the prime ministers, all of the kings, all of these different people in the world today, he going to bring it to nothing, bring them all to nothing. And then Yahushua is going to run the show, run the show. But before that, it's going to be one crying in the wilderness. Right. All this stuff is going to make sense when we get to Revelation. But it's going to be one crying in the wilderness that's saying, make straight the path. And then they're going to say to the cities of Judah, right, rise up, right? Because what's happening is things are going to be restored. So that's why Yahushua said Elijah must come to restore all things. Because everything has to be rebuilt. So before Yahushua comes, the, our, our land is going to be rebuilt. We're going to go through the wilderness and we're going to go. We're going to talk about all that when we get to Revelation, right? But all these are key things that you have to play. You have to, you have to understand for it all to make sense, right? Keep, uh, keep going. This is Matthew chapter uh, 17. Where did we leave off? Um, this is Matthew 17. Verse 12. It's Matthew chapter 17, verse 12. What does the book say? But I say unto you that Elijah has come already, and they knew him not, but have done to, unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic. And right. So, so now they came to the multitude and the multitude was like, hey, one of the guys in the multitude was like, hey, have mercy on my master. Have mercy on my son, because it, the book calls it a lunatic. But basically what he's saying, he's crazy. Right. My my son is, you know, what I'm saying he's not right in the brain. He's crazy. So he's like, have mercy on my son. You know, what I'm saying There's something wrong with it. Help him out. Right? And let's see what y'all she was said. For, for oftentimes he falleth into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples and they could not cure him. And Yahushua answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Yahushua rebuked the devil and he departed out of him and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Yahushua apart and said, so now Yahushua, look, this is a lunatic or a crazy person, right? Yahushua understood that he had a devil in him, right? So then the man whose son, he took his son to the disciples before he took him to Yahushua. But the disciples couldn't get the devil out of him. They couldn't heal him. So then Yahushua was like, man, this faithless generation. And Yahushua got the, commanded the, de the devil to come out of him, right? So then after that, Yahushua gets approached by the disciples and the disciple about to ask him. Watch this. And Yahushua said unto them, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, remove from here to yonder, yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Right? So then he tells them, he says, listen, if you have faith, the reason why y'all couldn't get that devil out of them, because y'all didn't have faith. Had you had faith, you would have been able to tell a mountain to get out of the way and go over there. Now, keep in mind what we just read in Isaiah chapter 40. Can Isaiah chapter 40, it said it's going to be one that has a voice that's crying in the wilderness. And he's going to say, make straight the path. And the mountains is going to fall down. Right. Just to make the, the, the land level. How you think he that 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 one that's crying in the wilderness, how you think he able to do that? Faith. This is what Yahushua was referring to. 
He is like, look, I'm telling you, had you had faith, you'll be able to tell a mountain to be removed. Right? You'll be able to tell a mountain to go somewhere else. Right? Keep going. Watch this. While they abode in Galilee, Yahshua said unto them, Son of man shall be betrayed into the hands of men. They shall kill him, and the third day he shall be raised again. They were exceedingly sorry. And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Does not your master pay tribute? And he so said, when they say yeah. tribute, what is it talking about? Taxes. We're talking about taxes. It's time to pay taxes. The boy that collect taxes came over to one of the disciples. He was like, hey, yo, master, what? He think he ain't got to pay taxes? What's going on? I'm trying to figure out what's going on. He don't, he don't think he got to pay taxes? Is that what he think? So then Peter, he trying to cover for him. Like, nah, nah. He, nah, he know he got to pay taxes. But they know y'all sure crazy. They looking like, nah, don't ask him directly. Y'all sure might say something wild to you. Then we all going to get locked up. So they trying to cover for y'all sure. Like, no, no, nah, he, he understand taxes. For sure. He going to pay taxes. Don't even worry about it. We'll get it right to you, all right? Appreciate you, my man. And then got up out of there. But then watch what Yahushua said. And he said, yes. And when he was come into the house, Yahushua prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of each of the earth take custom of tribute? Of their own right? tribute or of strength? So he asked him, Yahushua asked him, he is like, what do you think about it? Who do you think they collect tribute from? Do they collect it of, they all, uh, of, of the Gentiles? Or do they collect it of the children? Right, Rita, go ahead. What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? Peter said unto him, of strangers. And Yahushua said unto him, then are the children free? Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea and cast a hook. Take up the fish that fit, and take up the fish that fish cometh up, and when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money. Take it and give unto them for me and thee. Right? So the Yahushua's point is saying generally when they collect taxes, they will let their own people not pay taxes and they only collect it from the outsiders. Right? From the nations. Right? And so when they say, yeah, that's, that's usually how it works. Then Yahushua said, basically what Yahushua said, if I'm the king of all these people, then shouldn't I be free? Right? Are the children of our people free? If I'm the king of all these kings, then shouldn't it all be free? But he's looking like, but I don't want to offend nobody now. Going outside, find a little fish, open the mouth, you can find enough to pay our taxes off. <laughs> right? So now, Peter, you got to imagine Peter go out there, do it, find it. It's like, man, this guy is different. All these different things just keep happening. But his point, all in the point was saying, I'm the king. If they the kings, I'm the king of the kings. Do you think it's appropriate that they collect taxes from me? Don't you think I should be collecting taxes from them? And where do you think he got that from? This still more so for the people that's reading in the Bible in the year two. Right? Solomon, from God, what do you think? Solomon what? and David, they all had the nations pay him tribute. Oh, my goodness. I ain't got time. Yeah. I don't know. I appreciate you. I don't know what's wrong with that boy. Grab um, grab uh, 1 Kings chapter 9. Y'all hush. Grab uh, 1 Kings chapter 9. Let's see where y'all sure might have got this from. This 1 Kings chapter 9. Give me verse uh, 19. And all the cities of the store, of store that Solomon had, and cities for his chariots, and cities for his horsemen, and that which Solomon desired to build in Jerusalem, and in Lebanon, and in all the land of the of his dominion, and all the people that were left of the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites. All the people that was left of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the who? Hivites and Jebusites. The Hivites, the Jebusites, who else? Which, which were not of the children of Israel. Uh-huh. Their children that were left after them in the land, whom the children of Israel also were not able to utterly destroy upon those uh -huh. who have and levy a tribute of bond service unto this day. Right? So they had to pay tribute. All the strangers had to pay tribute. Guess who didn't have to pay tribute? Watch this. But of the children of Israel did Solomon make no bondmen, 
but they were men of war and his servants and his princes and his captains and rulers of his chariots and his horsemen. Where do you think Yahushua got it from? He is looking, he asked the question, he said, so let me just ask you, if a king going to collect tribute, usually going to collect it from the outsiders, not his own people, right? Okay. So do you think it's appropriate if I'm the king of all these kings that I should pay tribute to them? I didn't think so. But you know what? Nevertheless, I, I, he's like, I'm the one. Solomon testify of me. When Solomon was coming, he said, Solomon testify of me. But nevertheless, go open up that fish mouth. Get you a couple coins. You know what I'm saying? Get you a couple coins. Go ahead and pay our taxes off real quick. Right? Let's jump back. This is, uh, let's try to finish out this chapter. This is, uh, what, Matthew chapter 17, what? That was the end of the chapter. Oh, that was the end? Yeah. Okay, we can stop right there. Then we're going we gonna to get into chapter 18 next. Right? So we're going we gonna to keep on going in Matthew. And we're going to get into uh, Matthew chapter 18. And we're going to see it's, a, it's, a, it's some uh, interesting things that the Most High God is going to tell us. Uh, think about children, right? He's going to tell us, you know what I'm saying, how we should see children. Forgive me, um, your brother. Huh? Forgive me, your brother. Yep, forgiveness, right? A couple things we're going to learn about forgiveness and a few other principles we're going to learn in, in Matthew chapter 18. <laughs> Any questions? Is Matthew, Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 18, what we're going to read next week. We finished off Matthew 17. We are getting there. We are probably almost halfway through the gospel at this point. So we're making some good progress. We're moving. If y'all got questions, um, you can send the questions in. You can do it on the number where it's at over here. You could you can send it in through the number, through the email. You can send the questions in. Um, or you can catch us on the fellowship call tomorrow, Pacific time, 4 p.m. Y'all willing, we'll be there. You are free to join. Just reach out to us so you can get the information. I don't know what's wrong with you, boy, but you better get it together. Um, and that is all. I will see y'all when I see y'all. God bless. Let's pray out. What's up, boys? <laughs>